In this presentation, we will take a look at the book of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6. And I noticed, I just noticed I spelled Daniel wrong. Sorry for that. Chapters 1 through 6, the book of Daniel. Again, I would read the chapters as I will not go through the details of all the story, but so you'll already have that down, but just give commentary and insights on some of the verses. With that, let's take a look at an introduction here. Like many of his brethren, the prophets, Daniel was prepared and raised up as a minister to kings and emperors at the time that Nebuchadnezzar first carried the Jews captive into Babylon, which is around 605 BC. Daniel was chosen as one of the choicest youth, Jewish youths to be taken to Babylon and trained for service in the king's court. Because of his righteousness and sensitivity to the promptings of the Spirit, he was greatly favored of God. The Lord blessed him with the gift of interpreting dreams and visions. It almost has shades of the Joseph story, doesn't it? Joseph and his brothers. This endowment soon made him an object of great attention from the emperor and was raised to positions that enabled him to spend his life in service to the kings of the land. He became the Lord's ministers to those rulers. He was made chief of the wise men, chancellor of the equivalent of a national university, ruler of all the Hebrew captives, and as governor of the province of Babylon, one of the chief rulers in, Babylon, in, in both the Babylonian and Persian empires. Though at times his life was in danger because of the jealousy of evil men, yet he lived so that the Lord could continually protect and preserve him. Daniel perhaps reminds us more of Joseph who was sold into Egypt than does any other person in later Hebrew history. In fact, it would be not out of place for us to refer to him as the Joseph of the Babylonian captivity. Even after the fall of Babylon, Daniel was constitu what, I'm sorry, Daniel was continued in high office as one of the three presidents of the stat satraps under Darius the Mede. That's in Daniel 6.3. He seems to have kept his high position until the reign of Cyrus, and as far as we can ascertain, never returned to the Pal Palestine, but spent the remainder of his days in Babylon. That's interesting. He never does go back with those who returned to rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel and uh, Nehemiah. Evidently, his mission was to stay in Babylon. Although we know relatively little about the facts of Daniel's life, he is nevertheless revealed to us as a man of strong character, spirituality, and personal courage. Like Joseph of old, his great trust was in God, and came what may, he refused to be swept by a course of action contrary to his high ideals. He lives, he lives in the hearts of men because of that fact. Many great lessons many have learned because of Daniel and his integrity. Let's begin with Daniel chapter 1, coming on verses 1 through 2. What was the historical setting of Daniel's captivity? Most scholars agree that Nebuchadnezzar, as a Babylonian prince, was in command of his father's troops in 605 BC, when they soundly defeated the Egyptian forces at Carchemish. This defeat marked the beginning of the end of the Egyptian Empire as a world power and put the known world on notice that it would now have to reckon with Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar pursued the Egyptians southward and dealt them a worse defeat near Hamath, Hamath in Syria, thus securing Syrian and Judea for the expanded Babylonian Empire. See, as seen in Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, this drive resulted in the siege of Jerusalem in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim and in Judah's being made a vassal to Babylon for the next three years. At that time, many of the finest vessels of the temple were taken to Babylon as tribute. Selected members of Judah's upper class, which included Daniel, were carried captive to Babylon. Sometime during this campaign, Nebuchadnezzar learned of the death of his father, and within the year he returned to Babylon to be made king. Later, he besieged Jerusalem twice more, carrying off uh, additional captives both times, and eventually destroying Jerusalem about 587 BC. So you can see, Lehi was there when Babylon is becoming a power and has caused problems for Israel. But he leaves by the time 
comes and gets more additional captives by 587. All the evidence suggests that Daniel and his three companions were taken into captivity during the first exile of Babylon. Daniel lived in Jerusalem at the time Lehi did, though there is no evidence to suggest they knew each other, which also means there's no evidence to suggest that they didn't know each other. Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. What was the land of Shinar? Shinar was the plain of the lower delta country between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, where they approached the Persian Gulf. It was the ancient land of Chaldea or Babylonia. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. To whom does the word eunix refer? The word eunix is the English form of the Greek word, which means bedkeeper. In the strict and proper sense, they were the persons who had charged the bedchambers and palaces and large houses. But as the jealousy and dissolute temperament of the East required this charge to be in the hands of persons who had been deprived of their virility, the word unique came naturally to note persons in that condition. But as some of these rose to but as some of these rose to be confidential advisors of their royal masters or mistresses, the word was occasionally employed to note such persons in a position without indicating anything of their proper manhood. So three different definitions there. The bedkeeper, someone who has been castrated so that he could not have sex with the women since he's in charge of the bedchambers, and then one who hasn't been castrated but now is in a position of power with the master or mistresses. This word unique signifies officers, officers about or in the palace, whether literally eunuchs or not. Daniel 1.8, what was offensive about the king's meat? The term meat referred to the portion of food delicacies that graced the king's table. It doesn't necessarily have to mean like steak and that kind of meat, but just food. The reason for Daniel's refusal to eat the food may have the f include the following one. Some of the foods used by the Babylonians might have been among the items forbidden for consumption in the Mosaic Law. Okay, now since we don't know what foods they are, that's a possibility, but I don't think the highest possibility. Number two, Babylonians, like other heathens, ate beasts that had not been properly drained of blood, which was against the Mosaic Law, see Leviticus 3.17, and thereby violated the Mosaic Law. Th there's another possibility, high probability, why they didn't eat the food. Number three, I think, is the, the highest possibility and the reason why they are rejecting the food. Number three... The heathens consecrated the food of their feast by offering up part of the food and drink as sacrifices to their god. Thus, consuming such food would be participating in the worship of false gods. This being the most likely one of why Daniel and his companions refused to eat the king's food. Okay, so it was tantamount to, to worshiping idols worshiping false god, eating that food since it was dedicated, a part of it, to the gods of Babylon. And so Daniel did not want to show Jehovah that he worshiped false gods. Moreover, food which viewed as contaminated and unclean according to Jewish law when it was prepared by anyone considered unclean, such as the heathens. Daniel was strictly loyal to the Lord and refused to be involved in any practice associated with anything unclean or idolatrous. And so just the fact that this was food that had been offered up uh, part of it as offerings to their gods, therefore partaking of it means you worship those gods, would be good enough reason. And to give us pause on maybe why this story's in here. Do we ever do any of that? Are there things the world participates in that if we participate in it, what we're saying is we agree with you and we worship the same thing? Yeah, yeah, there is. Immodest dress, certain types of entertainment, language. You decide to participate in what the world does, then what you're pretty much saying is, yeah, we worship the same gods you do. We believe the same thing. 
And maybe that's the lesson we should take for them, not some word of wisdom thing. I think that's low on the totem pole. I think what's more applicable to us is quit participating in the things of the world. That's what Daniel's trying to teach us. So a gospel principle, partaking of the world's entertainment, food, fashions, language, etc., is also partaking of the gods they worship. Yeah, we should not do that. Or we're telling Jehovah, we don't really worship you. And Daniel was not willing to send that message. Are you and I? Daniel chapter 1, verses 12 through 6. So what is the pulse that they decided to eat instead? Pulse is such seeds and grains as peas, wheat, barley, and rye. Though eating pulse surely would have contributed to the good health of the Jewish youth, they were also blessed by God for adhering to his laws and thus became more healthy than those who ate the king's meat. Daniel chapter 1 verse 20. What is meant by the term astrologers and magicians? The Hebrew word for astrologers or magicians is ash, ash hafim which means an enchanter who uses incantations and who practices hidden arts. These people were frequently associated with evil spirits. Daniel and his brethren were found in truth. Daniel and his brethren were founded in truth and revelation from God and were thus of much greater wisdom and understanding than the king's magicians and astrologers. Daniel chapter 1, verse 21, what was Daniel's term of captivity in Babylon? Daniel was among those of the first captivity, and who remained in Babylon with many of other Jews, even after most of them had returned to their homeland to rebuild their temple and nation. He was in Babylon serving various kings through the 70 years of his Jewish captivity. Though there is no indication at his age at the time of his captivity, Daniel 1.21 shows that he lived to at least the age of 80. And so evidently, under the direction of Jehovah, he was to help kings in Babylon. And, and, and maybe that liaison between members of Christ's kingdom that were taken captive and, and the king instead of returning back and rebuilding Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 2 verse 5, did Nebuchadnezzar really forget his remarkable dream? Ellis T. Rasmussen, a great Hebrew scholar and Old Testament scholar, gave the following helpful commentary on the king's dream. In verse 5, the phrase, is gone from me, should properly read, is certain with me, as the Persian word, azda, sure, is used. Note in verse 9 that the king makes the point that he knows what he dreamt. Therefore, if the interpreters can tell him the dream, he will know that they know what they are talking about, and he will know whether he can have confidence in their interpretation or not. So he's not asking them to restate the dream because he doesn't know what it is. He's trying to see if they really know the dream and they can give a real interpretation. Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 through 19. Daniel and his companions preserved their lives by attaining revelation from God. The response of Daniel and his friends at a time when their lives were in danger because of the king's sentence and all the wise men illustrates the application of a principle taught by President Harold B. Lee. President Lee said, By faith in God, you can be attuned to the infinite and by power and wisdom obtained from your heavenly Father, harness the powers of the universe to serve you in your hour of need in a solution of problems too great your human strength or intelligence. Boy, that's all of us. We all need that revelation. Gospel principle, personal revelation is a gift from God. Daniel chapter 2 verse 28, did Nebuchadnezzar's dream pertain only to the latter days? The inspired interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel gave made it clear that the fulfillment of the king's dream would be in the immediate future, would begin in the immediate future. Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. The dream revealed events that would take place over a long span of time. The culmination, however, was to take place in the last days. The Hebrew word that was used Akariath means last or end. 
This definition, combined with the explanation given by Daniel in the added light of modern revelation, see Doctrine and Covenants 62, uh, 65.2 and 138.44, makes this clear. Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 45, what were the kingdoms represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? President Rudger Clausen elaborated on Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. President Clausen said, The world of today is witness to the fact that the very things which the great image stood for have occurred so far as time has gone. History certifies that the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, the Medes and the Persians, an inferior kingdom to Babylon, were the arms and breasts of silver. The Macedonian kingdom under Alexander the Great was the belly and thighs of brass, and the Roman kingdom under the Caesars was the leg of iron. For mark you, later on the kingdom or empire of Roman was divided. The head of the government in one division was at Rome, and the head of the government in the other division was at Constantinople. So these two great divisions represented the legs of iron. Finally, the Roman Empire was broken into smaller kingdoms represented by the feet and toes of iron, of iron and clay. Elder Orson Pratt said, in explaining why the toes were shown as being partly iron and clay, said that the feet and toes were governments more modern to grow out of the Iron Kingdom, the Roman Empire, after it should lose its strength. These are represented by the ten toes or ten kingdoms, which should be partly strong and partly broken. They should not have the strength of the leg of irons, but they should be mixed with mire clay, indicating both strength and weakness. President Spencer W. Kimball further clarified the prophecy with the following explanation. Rome would be replaced by a group of nations of Europe represented by the toes of the image. With the history of the world delineated in brief, now came the real revelation, Daniel said. And in the days of these kings, that is, the group of European nations, should the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. This is a revelation concerning the history of the world where one world power would supersede another until there would be numerous smaller kingdoms to share the control of the earth. And it was in the days of these kings that power would not be given to men, but the God of heaven would set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God upon the earth, which should never be destroyed nor left to other people. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was restored in 1830 after numerous revelations from the divine source. And this is the kingdom set up by God of heaven that would never be destroyed or superseded. And the stone cut out of the mountain without hands that would become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 45, how is it that the kingdom set up by God would consume the other kingdoms? Oh, we are witnessing that and still to witness great events concerning this particular prophecy. Section 65 of the Doctrine and Covenants tells the fulfillment of the rest of Daniel's prophecy. The prophet Joseph Smith prayed that the ecclesiastical kingdom of God, which was established on the earth in his day, might roll forth that the future kingdom of heaven might come. Right now, all we have of the kingdom of God, restored in 1830, is the ecclesiastical kingdom. God's kingdom is to be both ecclesiastical and political, governmental. Right now, we just have the ecclesiastical side. One day, the church, being the nucleus, will come to see, will consist of both ecclesiastical, religious, and political, governmental. That is yet still to happen. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, During the millennium, the kingdom of God will continue on earth, but in that day, it will be both an ecclesiastical and a political kingdom. That is, the church, which is the kingdom, will have the rule and government of the world given to it. So Elder McConkie saw it as a millennial time, that both would finally come together. The millennial kingdom can also be properly referred to as the kingdom of heaven, 
as Joseph Smith did in his inspired prayer, recorded in Doctrine and Covenant 65. The establishment of that kingdom is what the Lord taught the saints to pray for in the Lord's Prayer when he said, Thy kingdom come. The coming forth of the kingdom on the earth was what Daniel saw when the stone rolled forth and smote the image, eventually filling the whole earth. So we will not see the complete fulfillment of Daniel's vision of that stone in 1830 which was cut without hands, meaning it was not organized by man. God did it, not by human hands. Inspired godly hands started this kingdom, this church. And it will one day be a church and a government, the kingdom of heaven, both ruling during the millennium. That, section 65 says, we are to pray to bring about. President Brigham Young taught, the Lord God Almighty has set up a kingdom that will sway the scepter of power and authority over all the kingdoms of the world and will never be destroyed. It is the kingdom that Daniel saw and wrote of. It may be considered treason to say that the kingdom of that prophet foretold is actually set up, that we cannot help, but we know it. it is so, and so call upon the nations to believe our testimony. The kingdom will continue to increase, to grow, to spread, prosper more and more. Every time its enemies undertake to overthrow it, it will become more extensive and powerful. Instead of it decreasing, it will continue to increase. It will spread the more, become more wonderful and conspicuous to the nations until it fills the whole earth. See, we're still working on that. President Ezra Taft Benson said, this is the last and great dispensation in which the great consummation of God's purposes will be made. The only dispensation in which the Lord has promised that sin will not prevail. The church will not be taken from the earth again. It is here to stay. The Lord has promised it and you are part of that church and kingdom. The nucleus around which will be builded the great kingdom of God on the earth. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God on the earth will be combined together at Christ's coming. And that time is not far distant. How I wish we could get the vision of this work, the genius of it, and realize the nearness of that great event. I am sure it would have a sobering effect upon us if we realized what is before us. That was in 1988. So the two combining... A modern prophet has said that that would be at Christ's coming. Well, finally Christ will be able to rule and reign on the earth. And this church will be the nucleus around that political kingdom. Gospel principle, the destiny of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to become, king, become the kingdom of God during Christ's millennial reign. Daniel, chapter 2, verse 49. Daniel prospered because of his righteousness. President Spencer W. Kimball summarized the qualities that Daniel possessed and the blessings his obedience to God brought him. The gospel was Daniel's life. In the king's court, he could be little criticized. He could be little criticized, but even for a ruler, he would not drink the king's wine nor gorge himself with the meat and rich foods. His moderation and his purity of faith brought him health and wisdom and knowledge and skill and understanding, and his faith linked him closely to his Father in heaven, and revelations came to him as often as required. His revealing of the dreams of the king and the interpretations thereof brought him honor and acclaim and gifts and his position such as many men would sell their souls to get. Huh, interesting. You can sell your soul and get wisdom and power, or you can live God's life, go through God's way, get power, and also keep your soul. Probably a good measure on who we should vote for. If leaders are willing to sell their souls for power, maybe those are the ones we shouldn't be voting for. Gospel principle. Inasmuch as thy seed shall keep my commandments, they shall prosper in the land of promise. Daniel kept the commandments. He prospers. Just as Joseph did of Egypt. 
Daniel 3, 1 through 18, three Hebrews who were true to God in spite of threats and pressure. Daniel did not stand alone as an exemplary young man. His three companions demonstrated the same unswerving loyalty and devotion to God. Of them, Elder Spencer W. Kimball said, We remind ourselves of the integrity of the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, like Daniel, defied men and rulers to be true to themselves to keep faith with their faith. They were required by decree of the emperor to kneel down and worship a monumental image of gold which the king had set up. In the face of losing caste or losing position of angering the king, they faced the fiery furnace rather than to fail and deny their god. The cunning, devised scheme worked as the vicious planners expected. The denunciation must have been exciting with the people from far and near attending the dedication of this new statue. Had there ever been such an image, such a spectacle, 90 feet of gold in the form of a man, what could be more scintillating, more sparkling? There must have been almost countless people milling in the streets and in the area where the gigantic image stood when the herald announced the procedure and the creed that all must know at the sound of the music and all must worship the image. Neither the cunning of the deceivers, the conspiring, cunning tricksters, nor the fear of the king and what he could do to them dissuaded the three courageous young men from their true path of rightness. When the prearranged sounds of the cornet, flute, harp, and other instruments reverberated through the area, and the masses of men and women everywhere filled their homes and the streets with kneeling worshippers of the huge golden image, Three men refused to insult their true God. They prayed to God, and when confronted by the raging and furious emperor, they courageously answered in the face of what could be certain death. That is powerful. Can you imagine the pressure it would have been to just kneel? Just take a knee. Go along with the crowd. Go along with the activists. Go along with what everybody's saying. No, they are true to their God and they stand tall and refuse to take a knee. Boy, if that isn't appropriate for today, I don't know what is. Daniel 3, 7, 2 through 18. But if not, Daniel 3, 7 through 18 says, if it so be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of mine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Brothers and sisters, do we have the faith to say, but if not? That is the question. The question is not whether Christ can do miracles. The New Testament Book of Mormon proved that. That's the wrong question. The question is not whether he can do miracles or life. The question is, can you and I be able to say, but if not? But if God decides that is not what is supposed to happen, can you still obey him and follow him? Can we? Or does things have to be done our way? Do the outcomes have to be the outcomes we want? Can we trust the outcomes Christ wants? That's what they're saying. Regardless of the outcome, Nebuchadnezzar, we will not lose faith in Christ, the great Jehovah. But if not, well, that's the test we have today. When trial, sickness, disease, whatever comes, can we say, yeah, I'd like a miracle, God, but if not, I will not abandon thee. Because there are times where it will be, but if not. Ask Abinadi. Ask John the Baptist with losing his head. Ask those who Alma and Amulek see thrown into the pit of fire because they would not denounce Christ. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we too, do we, do we have the faith not to be healed? Do we have the faith to be able to say, but if not? Elder Bednar addressed this vitally important topic. Listen to the story he tells and the counsel he gives. 
Elder David A. Bednar. Since my call to the Quorum of the Twelve, my assignments and travels had enabled me to become acquainted with faithful, courageous, and valiant Latter-day Saints all over the world. I want to tell you about one young man and one young woman who have blessed my life and with whom I have learned spiritually vital lessons about not shrinking and about allowing our individual will to be swallowed up in the will of the Father. The account is true and the characters are real. I will not, however, use the actual names of the individuals who are involved. I use with permission selected statements from their personal journals. John is a worthy priesthood holder and served faithfully as a full-time missionary. After returning home from his mission, he dated and married a righteous and wonderful young woman, Heather. John was 23, Heather was 20, on the day they were sealed together for time and all eternity in the house of the Lord. Approximately three weeks after their temple marriage, John was diagnosed with bone cancer. Because cancer nodules were discovered in his lungs, the prognosis was not good. Three months later, John underwent a surgical procedure to remove a large tumor in his leg. Two days following the operation, I visited John and Heather in the hospital. We talked about the first time I met John in the mission field, about their marriage, about the cancer, about the eventual important lessons we learn through trials of mortality, or eternally important lessons. As we concluded our time together, John asked if I would give him a priest a blessing. I responded that I would gladly give such a blessing, but I first needed to ask some questions. I then posed questions I had not planned to ask and had never previously considered. John, do you have the faith not to be healed? If it is the will of our Heavenly Father that you are transferred by death in your youth to the spirit world to continue your ministry, do you have the faith to submit to his will and not be healed? Now that's a heck of a dang good question. Do we have the faith not to be healed? I, I think dying takes more faith than living. Continuing Elder Bednar, frequently in the scriptures, the Savior or his servants exercise the spiritual gift of healing and perceived that an individual had the faith to be healed. That is, John and Heather and I counseled together and wrestled with these questions. We increasingly understood that if God's will were for this good young man to be healed, then that blessing could be received only if this valiant couple first had the faith not to be healed. In other words, John and Heather needed to overcome, through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, the natural man tendency in all of us to demand immediately and insist insistently on the blessings we want and believe we deserve. We recognize the principle that applies to every devoted disciple. Strong faith in Savior is submissively accepting His will and timing in our lives, even if the outcome is not what we hoped for or wanted. Certainly, John and Heather would desire, yearn, and plead for healing with all their might, mind, and strength. But more important, they would be willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon them, even as a child does submit to his father. Indeed, they would be willing to offer their whole souls as an offering unto him, and humbly pray, Father, if thou be willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. After taking the necessary time to ponder my inquiries and talk with his wife, John said to me, Elder Bednar, I do not want to die. I do not want to leave Heather. But if the will of the Lord is to transfer me to the spirit world, then I guess I am good with that. Heather wrote, This day was filled with mixed emotions for me. I was convinced that Elder Bednar would place his hands on John's head and completely heal him of the cancer. I knew that through the power of the priesthood he could be healed. I wanted so badly for that to happen. And after he taught us about the faith not to be healed, I was terrified. 
Up to that point, I had never had to come to grips with the fact that the Lord's plan might include losing my new husband. My faith was dependent upon the outcomes I wanted. In a manner of speaking, it was one-dimensional. Though terrifying at first, the thought of having the faith not to be healed ultimately freed me from worry. It allowed me to have complete trust in my Heavenly Father. Knew, complete trust that my Heavenly Father knew better than I knew myself, and He would do what was best for me and John. Righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in moving mountains, if moving mountains accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with his will. Righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in healing the sick, deaf, and lame, if such healing accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with his will. Thus, even if we have strong faith, many mountains will not be moved. And not all of the sick and infirmed will be healed. If all opposition were curtailed, if all maladies were removed, then the primary purposes of the Father's plan would be frustrated. Many of the lessons we are to learn in mortality can be received only through the things we experience and sometimes suffer. And God expects and trusts us to face temporary mortal adversity with his help so we can learn what we need to learn and ultimately become what we are to become in eternity. This story about John and Heather is both ordinary and extraordinary. This young couple is representative of millions of faithful, covenant-keeping Latter-day Saints all over the world who are pressing forward with the straight and narrow path. With, steadfast, with steadfast faith in Christ and a perfect brightness of hope. John and Heather were not serving in highly visible leadership positions in the church. They were not related to a general authority, and sometimes they had doubts and fears. In many, in many of these aspects, their story is quite ordinary. But this young man and young woman were blessed in extraordinary ways to learn essential lessons for eternity through affliction and hardship. I have shared this episode with you because John and Heather, who were just like so many of you, came to understand that not shrinking is more important than surviving. Thus, their experience was not primarily about living and dying. Rather, it was about learning, living, and becoming. Now, I know many are going to know what happened to him. Did he live? That doesn't matter, does it? The miracle is he kept, they kept their faith and were willing to do anything God wanted, even if it meant not getting healed. If the miracle was to face death with faith, then that's what they were willing to do. So it doesn't matter how the story ends. What matters is how you end, how you and I face. Am I only faithful when the outcomes are what I want? Or can I say, but if not, and be good with that and still stay faithful and true to Jesus Christ? There's the question. There's the test. Gospel principle. Faith is doing what God wants, when God wants it, and how God wants it, regardless of the outcome. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 23, the casting of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. To heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be is presumed to be an idiomatic way of saying that the furnace was to be heated much hotter than usual, to be heated as hot as it could be heated. If there were if the three were brought up to the furnace, it must have had a mouth above through which the victims could be cast into it. When heated to an ordinary degree, this could be done without danger to the men who performed this service. But in the present case, the heat of the fire was so great that the servants themselves perished by it. The king apparently viewed the events in the furnace through an opening at the bottom. 
Daniel 4, chapters 8, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 9, 8 through 9, the spirit of the holy gods. That Nebuchadnezzar recognized Daniel's ability to receive revelation from God is clear from the events associated with Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's previous dream. The heathens believed that the revelation of supernatural secrets belonged to the gods, and that the man who had this power must possess the spirit of the gods. Daniel's spiritual powers, however, did not necessarily convert Nebuchadnezzar from his polytheistic beliefs or his belief in the supreme Babylonian god Baal. By acknowledging Daniel's spiritual abilities, Nebuchadnezzar was not acknowledging Jehovah as the only or true and supreme god, just that acknowledged that a god was with him and respected that. Daniel chapter 4, verse 19 to 37, Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the tree hewn down. Here's just a brief explanation of this particular interesting dream. Given by uh, Dr. Sidney B. Sperry, another great Old Testament scholar. The dream disturbed Daniel greatly, but Nebuchadnezzar told him not to let the dream or its interpretation affright him. Doubtless the reason why the prophet was shaken in spirit was that the dream concerning the king personally, and he hesitated to give him bad news. Nevertheless, here is the interpretation which he gave. The tree in all its strength and greatness represented the king and the extent of his dominion in the earth. The stump of the tree and his portion with the beasts of the field till seven times should pass over him represented the fact that the king should be driven out from men become insane and dwell with the beast and eat grass like oxen for seven years until he acquired sufficient humility to realize that the Most High rules among men. The stump left in the earth meant that the dominion of the king should be made sure to him after he had learned his lesson that the heavens not men rule. Daniel then counseled the king to repent of his sins and make amends for them. After a year's time, the doom pronounced upon Nebuchadnezzar literally came to pass. So that's what you see in verses 38 through 33. This strange narrative is regarded as one of the historical perplexities of the book of Daniel. The disease with which the king was afflicted is known technically as lysanthropy. The patient believes that he has been changed into an animal and to a limited extent acts like it. We may presumably assume that Daniel advised the king to make suitable arrangements beforehand for the government of his dominion in preparation for the day when his affliction would come upon him. What part of the prophet played in those preparations or in the actual government of Babylon during the time of Nebuchadnezzar's reason Nebuchadnezzar's reason was gone, we are not able to say. Suffice it to say, the king's faculties were, were, were restored, and he gave praise to the Most High. Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 through 37, Nebuchadnezzar praises God. That Nebuchadnezzar praised and glorified God after his reason restored to him indicates that he recognized his experience as a just punishment for his pride. It does not necessarily follow, however, that this experience caused his sincere repentance or conversion to the God of Daniel. Nevertheless, it is remarkable that Daniel had even that much influence on a man steeped in idolatry and heathen superstitions. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king. Many scholars have questioned the validity of the statement that Belshazzar was the king of Babylon because Belshazzar never reigned as a sole king and is never designated as king, Sharu, in the cuneiform inscriptions. Furthermore, it is maintained that there is no evidence to show that Belshazzar even ruled upon the throne as a subordinate to Nabonidus, his father. In reply to these charges, we may note, first of all, that the Aramaic word Malka, king, need not have the connotation of monarch or sole king. Furthermore, one of the cuneiform documents expressly states that Nabonidus entrusted the kingship to Belshazzar. In all probability, there was a co-regency between Nabonidus and Belshazzar in which Belshazzar occupied a subordinate position. 
Since, however, he was the man upon the throne with whom Israel had to do, he is designated king in the book of Daniel. No valid objection can be raised against this usage. Daniel, chapter 5, verse 3, drinking from the vessels of the temple. So as they have a raucous party, and in their worldly state and drunkenness and frivolity, and I'm sure having to do with sexuality too, they start drinking from the vessels that were taken from the temple of Jerusalem, sacred vessels of Jehovah. When the Babylonians overthrew Jerusalem, they carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord. As Kylan Delich noted, during the feast, the Babylonians drank out of the holy vessels of the temple of God of Israel to glorify their heathen gods in songs of praise. In doing this, they did not only place Jehovah on a perfect level with their gods, but raised them above the Lord of heaven as Daniel charged the king. See verse 23. The carrying away of the temple vessels of Babylon and placing them in the temple of Baal was a sign of the feet of the God to whom these vessels were consecrated. The use of these vessels in the drinking of the wine at the festival amid the singing of songs in praise and of the gods was accordingly a celebration of these gods as victorious over the God of Israel. See, this is going to be the prelude to the writing on the wall. <laughs> and that God, Jehovah, is going to tell the king that he is going to die. You don't mock God and get away with it. Gospel principle. The world seeks to diminish or even eliminate the true God in order to rationalize their behavior. See, we took your best stuff. We, our gods must be more powerful. L little, well, not too long we're going to find out that that was not true. Daniel 5, 6, what is meant by the phrase, the joints of his loins were loosed. The great fear that came upon the king is described in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible as his limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. So he is so terrified as what is written on the wall in the interpretation that he just loses strength. Daniel 5, 7, the third ruler in the kingdom. The Hebrew word is translated third, third ruler means one of three. The promise was that the interpreter of the writing would be made third in authority in the kingdom next to Nabonidus and Belshazzar. The scarlet, sometimes purple clothing, and the chain of gold mentioned in Daniel 5-7 were symbols of rank worn by high officials. So the interpreter of the writing, which would be Daniel, one of three, he will be placed in high authority. Daniel 5.17, let thy gifts be to thyself. Those who function under the influence of the Spirit of God have increased capabilities, not because of their own qualifications, but because of the power of God, which they are privileged to use. They are servants in the Lord's hands who are to bless others and carry out the Lord's will. Daniel knew this and neither deserved nor sought for earthly reward, rewards for his role as an instrument in the hands of God. Daniel 5, 25-29, the interpretation of the handwriting on the wall. A handwriting on the wall indicated not only that the Babylonian kingdom would be overthrown, but also the means by which it would be overthrown. Mene numbered, that is, God has numbered the days of the kingdom. To kill a shekel used both as a coin, or shekel, used both as a coin and as a weight, indicated that Belshazzar was weighed in the balances and found deficit. Perez, division, your kingdom is divided, Perez, and given to the Medes and Persians, Paros. The word Paros would seem to point out that the Persians were the dominant power to whom Babylon, Babylon would fall. When Daniel read the writing, he read when when Daniel read the writing he read and Parzin, verse 25, but in giving the interpretation, he employed the form Parez, verse 28, we have thus a play on words in which the basic idea of division is linked with the name of the conqueror. You're going to be divided, Perez, but the Paraz, the Persians, will be the ones who will divide you and conquer you. Again, 
They should learn the lesson. You don't mock God and make fun of his sacred emblems or objects. Daniel 5.29, why was Daniel rewarded by the king when he prophesied of the king's destruction? Although Belshazzar did not believe that Daniel's God was the only true God, it is likely that he, like other heathens, believed in the gods, small g, and in revelations from God. He must have been deeply impressed with Daniel's ability to interpret the writing on the wall because he rewarded him handsomely, which Daniel refuses. Kyle and Dillich suggest another possible reason. Belshazzar perhaps secretly believed that believed the threatened judgment from God to be so near as it actually was, and perhaps he hoped to be able, by conferring honor upon Daniel, to appease the wrath of God. Daniel 5.30, was Babylon really overthrown in one night? Babylon was surrounded by a massive wall over 100 feet thick and 300 feet high. To breach such a wall, even with constant sieging, would take months. And yet there is no hint in Daniel's record that the city was under siege at this time. Could a city of Daniel's size and fortifications be taken in one night? Historical sources other than the Bible indicate that this is exactly what happened, supporting Daniel's record exactly. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus recorded that Cyrus had previously caused the Palacopus, a canal which ran west of the city and carried off the sulfurous water of the Euphrates into the lake of ne Neocris, to be cleared out in order to turn the river into it, which by this means was rendered so shallow that his soldiers were able to penetrate along its bed into the city. Thus, the Persians marched under the massive walls. The river is running under the walls. They divert the river another way and drain it so they can go under the wall where the river was. No revenge was to be taken. The city was to have its normal life restored quickly as possible. The gods which Nabonidus had taken from the equally well treated provincial cities were to be restored at once. There was above all to be no terrorizing of the population. Indeed, Cyrus intended to change some of the policies of Nabonidus, which had made him objectionable to his subjects. One can imagine the reception Cyrus received when he made his appearance in the capital a few weeks after its capture. He was not a conqueror, he was a liberator. And far from the installing a foreign ruler over the people, Cyrus personally took the role of Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, in the New Year festival, thereby claiming for himself and his heirs the right to rule the Babylonian Empire by divine designation. Daniel chapter 6, chapter, verse 10, Daniel's response to a heathen decree. Those who are righteous do not fear their people. Their only desire is to serve and honor God. With the same faith that his brethren, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had shown in refusing to bow down to the idol, Daniel refused to follow the decree that condemned petitioners to any god but the king. Edward Spencer W. Kimball wrote, these vicious men conspired to destroy Daniel. Their clever trick would end his dominion. Knowing the faith and the habits of Daniel, they could not fail. Preying upon the pride and vanity of the emperor, his conceit, his egotism, they persuade him to sign an unbreakable law, a law which forbade anyone in the ensuing, ensuing 30 days asking any petition of anyone but Darius. The penalty was to be consigned to the den of lions. Darius signed the decree, not knowing it was leveled at his friend. This unalterable law of the Medes and Persians would have been terrifying to any man, but the faithful Daniel did not flinch. Was there any question what he should do? He could save his life by abandoning his prayers to the living God. What was he to do? A man of integrity could not fail. Daniel was the soul of integrity. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. 
even as he knew that, that was breaking the law. There are some things that government can decree that do not override God. And Daniel was not to give in. What God decrees, man cannot override. And Daniel knew that and stayed faithful to it. Gospel principle, all of this will be tested at the level of our, to the level of our integrity towards God and his kingdom. Daniel 6.10, why did Daniel pray three times a day towards Jerusalem? Solomon, in his dedicatory prayer of the temple in Jerusalem, referred to the people's praying towards the city which thou hast chosen and towards the house that I have built for thy name. 1 Kings 8.44 The prophet Joseph Smith once counseled the twelve apostles to, quote, make yourselves acquainted with those men who, like Daniel, pray three times a day towards the house of the Lord. President Wilford Woodruff said, in the, in the dedicatory prayer of the Salt Lake Temple said, Heavenly Father, when thy people shall not have the opportunity of entering this holy house to offer their supplications unto thee, and they are oppressed and in trouble, surrounded by difficulties, or assailed by temptation, and shall turn their faces towards this, this thy holy house, and ask thee for deliverance, for help, for thy power to be extended in their behalf, we beseech thee to look down from thy holy habitation and mercy and tender compassion upon them and listen to their cries. This is not to suggest that the direction which one faces when one prays has mystical significance, but rather that it is an attitude of spiritual facing. To face the temple, which is the temp which is the temporary Temporal, I apologize, the temple representation of the house of God suggests that one turns one heart to the Lord and the covenants made in the temples to be more like him. President, Wolford, President Woodruff clarified this point in what he said next in that dedicatory prayer. Or when the children of thy people in years to come shall be separated through any cause from this place, and their hearts shall turn in remembrance of thy promises to this holy temple, and they shall cry unto thee from the depths of their affliction and sorrow to extend relief and deliverance to them. We humbly entreat thee to turn thine ear and mercy to them, hearken to their cries, and grant unto them the blessings for which they ask. So it was symbolic of facing God. That's who I face. I face you. My back is to the world. And so the lesson what Daniel's teaching is, brother, who, brothers and sisters, who do we face? Do we face Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven and the covenants we have made in sacred temples and baptismal fonts? And we face them and our backs to the world? Or do we turn our back to them and we face the world and capitulate to the world? Well, we're going to face somebody and we have to decide which one it will be. And Daniel was symbolically showing who he faced by praying towards the temple. Gospel principle. We will all show God whether we face him or the world by the use of our agency and obedience to God or the world. Who do we face? Well, thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation and subscribe to the channel.